Okay, so uh, welcome to everybody. Um, so today we are very pleased to um, welcome um, Javier uh, Rocamazza. He's a specialist in uh, low energy uh, nuclear physics as well as in um, nuclear astrophysics. He's an expert in density functional uh, theories and beyond. Uh, he calculates ground state properties of uh, nuclei and the collective nuclear vibration, and he's interested in the symmetry energy, in particular, how it can be constrained by elastic electron scattering in nuclei. He's also very much interested in neutron stars and uh, in the structure and composition of uh, its uh, crust. So uh, Javier defended his PhD in 2010 at the University of uh, Barcelona under the supervision of uh, Professor uh, Javier uh, Vinyas uh, on isos uh, isospin asymmetry in stable and exotic nuclei. He has been awarded the special mention in the dissertation award uh, in nuclear physics of the nuclear physics division of the European Physical Society. And then, uh, after his PhD, he performed a postdoc at the University of Milano, and he became assistant professor there in 2013. Up to now, he published more than 30 papers, and uh, five of which has more than uh, 100 citations. So today, he will present a colloquium webinar, where uh, he will introduce a strong uh, synergy between heaven and earth, which is instru instrumental for the study of uh, the nuclear uh, functional state. So thank you very much, Javier, for uh, accepting our invitation. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to you for the nice introduction and invitation to give a seminar. Uh, that's, uh, that's my pleasure to be here. And so uh, let, me, let me start with my presentation in my slides. So uh, as you see the topic, the title of my, my, my slides are very, is very general. So of course I will not be that general, uh, my, as Jerome mentioned, so my interest is in low energy nuclear physics. So my perspective will be more on that side. And uh, on the other side, I have, I must uh, tell you that I, I have prepared some slides, which are more than I, I would, I would, um, I would be able to explain to you today, but that's not a problem. So I will tell you to give you some feeling or some idea of, uh, some topics re uh, related to the question of state, the symmetry energy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and also some observables that may be interesting for, for the determination or to learn about the question of state, the nuclear question of state. And, and then, uh, but then uh, I will leave this some extra slides so that you can have all the material in, for the sake, let's say, of completeness, right? So I will uh, go into detail into some slides, other slides, I will just give, leave them there. To this for the sake of completeness, so that you can check them and maybe you have some question or some doubt, uh, you can have some reference there, or you can also contact me uh, and we can discuss about what's not mentioned in the in the during this colloquium. Okay, so let's start. So uh, we know that uh, we know that uh, we can find uh, neutrons and protons uh, form uh, forming clusters. That's typical to find it in the Earth, right? And we know that due to the short range nature of, nature of the uh, strong interaction, the, the nuclear strong interaction, we know that uh, in the interior, so nucleons, let's say, doesn't, doesn't see, uh, if you want, in first approximation, all the nucleons in the nucleus. And therefore, those which are more in the interior just see those which are closer to them. That means that it's similar, if you want, like a piece of infinite matter. Infinite matter meaning an infinite system of neutrons and protons, like what we may found, for example, in the outer crust and the outer, sorry, in the outer core of a neutron star, where we believe there we can find a, a neutron matter with some small fraction of protons and some electrons and muons to, to uh, in order to uh, ensure the a charge neutrality. Uh, therefore, to study the question of state that does that characterize, as I will show you later, the, uh, in, this, in this slide, to characterize the nuclear equation of state that uh, is, uh, let's say, uh, characterizing me uh, or characterizing an infinite system or a very large system, if you like, uh, made of neutrons and protons, okay, uh, we will usually assume zero temperature because you would need actually very large temperatures, as I am indicating in this slide, 
in order to change the nuclear structure in a nucleus, for example. Uh, so we will uh, usually refer to the question of state as uh, an infinite system of neutrons and protons at zero temperature. Okay, that can be uh, described by the energy per particle as a function of the neutron and proton densities, at, as I am here, as I'm showing you in this slide. And you can use uh, also uh, you can use to this to, to let's say to write down this energy per particle, the neutron densities and proton densities, or the total density and some uh, delta parameter I'm, telling, I'm, I'm indicating in this uh, slide, which is just the relative difference between the neutrons and proton density. This would be if you write the, the, the energy per particle in isospin, let's say, formalism. Uh, typically, uh, what we can do or what people is doing is just to expand in a Taylor series this uh, energy per particle, this small a, a I'm showing you here in the slide, and in as a, um, um, assuming this delta parameter is small, okay? This delta parameter is actually small in reality in stable nuclei. Uh, it starts to become larger and larger for exotic nuclei, and it is, let's say, uh, uh, the biggest possible when you only have neutrons, for example, right? For example, in a neutron star. Uh, even though this is a Taylor expansion for delta small, it is, has been, let's say, um, it has been checked that at least around saturation densities, this expansion is also good even though for neutron matter. So that, that means that if we stay in systems which are, uh, uh, that which are around the saturation density, this kind of parabolic expansion on the delta parameter, uh, it's good. If you go then to neutron stars, then, then it's not that good because you go to very, very large densities, especially in the interior of the star in the, in the core, and, but at least for the study of, uh, of uh, nuclei in the laboratory, this type of expression of the equation of state by measuring observables in the laboratory, this type of expression will be already okay. Uh, in order to better characterize this uh, equation of state, we used to define some parameters. That is, we try to expand this equation of state uh, in a Taylor expansion around saturation density because uh, from the perspective of uh, the low, let's say, energy nuclear physics, uh, we had, let's say, essentially nuclei because it is what we have, let's say, around. And therefore, and therefore, uh, traditionally, this equation of state has been expanded around saturation so it's that we can define different parameters. For example, the energy uh, of symmetric matter that would correspond to the uh, green dot in the, in the figure Okay, this is the energy per particle of a system which has the same number of new, the same density of neutrons and protons. Uh, and that we see that saturate. Okay, the saturation it uh, must occur. Okay, otherwise the matter will not be stable. <clears throat> and then we have this uh, K0 parameter, which is what we call the, com the, in the compressibility or incompressibility in this case of symmetric nuclear matter. And then we have, uh, we can also expand the, symmet the symmetry energy, which is this S uh, factor, this S function, which is multiplying the delta square term. And this symmetry energy, if you stay uh, to the first order, allow you to define, or yes, to define the symmetry energy at saturation, which is the J parameter, the slope of the symmetry energy at saturation, which is the L parameter, okay, and the and the uh, casein, which is the curvature of the symmetry energy around saturation. This gives you information uh, uh, in the system in which the, new, the number of neutrons and protons is not balanced, like in symmetric matter, but is unbalanced. So when you have a neutron rich nucleus, for example, uh, uh, you will have uh, contributions from, uh, from that we call the symmetry energy. And since the nuclei are close to saturation density, uh, the study of uh, nuclear observables will be somehow related to these parameters. And one of our jobs is to try to understand these parameters, the values of these parameters that can be inferred from the experiment. Okay, so just to give you an example. So for example, here we have, uh, we have uh, I wrote you, right? Uh, and if we want uh, to determine the, uh, the equation of state parameters, which correspond to the saturation density, which in principle one must de determine from experiment, or the saturation energy, uh, one immediately realized that uh, the accuracy with which we are able to measure, for example, the binding energy of a nucleus like lead 208, uh, okay, uh, would require a determination of the 
of the saturation energy per particle uh, of the equation of the state, which is with, 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 sorry, with an accuracy of 10 to the minus six, which is incredibly good accuracy. At the moment, the best models we have to describe binding energies, uh, uh, binding energies in nuclei uh, can get up to more or less 0.1% accuracy. Something similar happens for radii, where we would need in order to describe uh, the charge radii of nuclei, uh, an accuracy in the determination of the saturation density which must be around 0.1%, while the best models uh, available today uh, are able to describe it within 1% accuracy, maybe slightly better, but not that much better. So we are somehow uh, not uh, close to the accuracy required to determine the saturation density and saturation energy uh, with the models uh, available nowadays. But uh, we are doing quite, let's say, I would say quite well somehow. So we are able to describe anyway masses of nuclei with, for example, this energy density functional theory um, within one to two MeV, uh, which is not bad, for example, for a heavy nucleus, which like lead 208. But still, uh, we, we will need much more accuracy if we want to, if we want to find, uh, if we want to find, uh, which is the precise saturation energy and density. And that's for symmetric matter, which is well known, as you know, from, from many decades probably. So what happens when you go to, for example, uh, the symmetry, symmetry energy, what I call before symmetry energy, or you want to the neutron matter equation of state that uh, neutron matter you will find in the upper panels and while symmetry energy is drawn in the lower panels all the time uh, as a function of the density of the system. So the total density of the system, neutrons plus protons. Uh, in the left uh, panels, uh, uh, we see some microscopic uh, predictions for that. So microscopic, I mean, some what we call also in our field, up initial, up initial models. Uh, and in the right-hand side, this phenomenological model that is essentially energy density functional, okay? Uh, as you can see, so in these figures, we don't need to look into detail. The important thing is that uh, doesn't matter the models you are looking at, uh, all of them seems to show uh, similar spreads as a function of the density. If we look at the neutron matter equation of a state or the symmetry energy, meaning that doesn't matter to uh, how do you build your effective interaction, at the moment we are not able, we are not able to go, uh, let's say, um, uh, in a more precise way into uh, the equation of state. Uh, just to remind you that, for example, energy density functions are typically uh, models that are typically fitted to uh, data uh, in, uh, let's say, in nuclei, heavy nuclei, for example, as well, maybe kind of like nuclei, but led 208, calcium 40, I don't know, zirconium, uh, such kind of nuclei. Uh, while uh, these more macroscopic or macroscopic, uh, let's say, theories, are typically fitted to nuclear nucleus catering data in the vacuum, and maybe for three body forces they use helium three or something or something like that. Okay, meaning that uh, we are actually fitting very deep fitting or finding the parameters of our effective interactions, both in both sides, phenomenological and microscopic. And let's say by looking at a very different uh, systems regarding uh, its size and regarding uh, the many body effects that one must need in, to take into account. Uh, but it doesn't matter, we get uh, similar, uh, let's say, discrepancies in our predictions of the equation of the state when uh, it, um, it's, um, when, the new, when, let's say, when you have more, let's say, neutrons and protons in your system, okay? And you can, so before going ahead, sorry, uh, and you can imagine that if uh, uh, the equation of the state is just one building block, you need in order to study nuclei or one building block you in order to study the neutron star. So in, in the case in which you will want to become and, and, uh, and be able to reproduce or to study the real, the real system, you will have much more uncertainties or much more unknowns, okay? Because you will need to introduce, for example, in nuclei the surface effect or curvature effect, or you must need to take into account many other effects that are, uh, that will, let's say, somehow, and make your life uh, more difficult. Okay, so let's now to check uh, and see what, what would be, in my opinion, of course, because this, uh, the list I will show you now is not, let's say, exhaustive. So I will show you 
some observables that I believe uh, might be, might be, might be, uh, let's say, promising observables in order to learn uh, about the question of state. And, and also, I will show you, or I will discuss some, uh, also some uh, observations from Newton's star that may also be important for the study of the nuclear equation of state. Okay, so let's start from the astrophysical side. So you know uh, that by giving an equation of state for a neutron star, which is basically, let's say, deal from the neutron matter equation of state I just show you, okay? Uh, one can get uh, uh, the mass radius relation for a star. So the equation of state for the star, okay? The mass as a function of the radius of the star. And that's a very, let's say, very uh, important quantity of the star, okay? One of the most basic quantities of the star. And, and for uh, describing this mass radius relation, this neutral matter equation of state I was showing you before is instrumental. If you do the exercise and, and assume that uh, actually there is no interaction among neutrons and solve the mass radius relation for a star just assuming a free Fermi gas of neutrons, you will get a maximum mass, which is around 0 0.7 solar masses. And we already have measured so, neutron stars or measure or observed neutron stars which has more than uh, or around two solar masses. So that means that all the way from 0 0.7 solar masses to two solar masses, everything you put there, or many things you put there, maybe not all of them, but many of, many of the things you need to put there is nuclear field, okay? Low energy nuclear field. And therefore to measure, so you can understand immediately that to measure the, new, the mass and radius of the star, okay? And to try to, go uh, and, and let's say measure, let's say experimentally, oh, sorry, experimentally, observationally, this, uh, this uh, mass radius curve, okay, would be essential because we know the equation of the state must be only one. There are not many equations of state, okay? There is one to describe nuclei, one to describe the star, and therefore uh, a measure like this, uh, measure, sorry, observations like this may help us quite a lot in order to learn about, about uh, the equation of state. Okay, what else we can learn uh, from, the, uh, from the heaven, from the heaven on the equation of state. So we know that uh, uh, from gravitational waves, okay? So this, the gravitational wave signal, uh, up to now we are able to measure just, uh, as just, before, uh, just before the merger occurs, okay? And the gravitational wave signal up to this point, okay, before the upgrades and before the new, the, the new, let's say, the new, um, the new, the new facilities become available for measuring also the post-merger. Uh, we know that the gravitational wave signal essentially uh, for us nuclear physicists uh, will provide us with the so-called tidal deformability. So this type of gravitational wave signal, it can be shown that it is essentially giving you uh, what we call the, di the tidal deformability that is nothing but the uh, quadruple polarizability uh, uh, for those who are more used to giant resonances, for example, okay? So uh, it is nothing that the uh, quadru quadruple polarizability, okay? So the star due to the gravitational field of the other star, okay? And the fourth and the first contribution from the first multiple that can be excited, if you like, is the quadruple. And this gives you uh, an idea on how easy it is to deform in a quadrupolar way uh, the star. Okay. And this has it, it has a direct, let's say, uh, a direct, let's say, relation uh, with the nuclear equation of state. Okay. So here, for example, in the in the figure uh, in the right hand side. Uh, the tidal deformability, which is this lambda parameter, is uh, plotted for different uh, models, energy density functions, in that case, which are the blue dots, and uh, as a function of the radius, okay? This type of, this, sorry, tidal deformability or quadruple polarizability uh, must be proportional or must grow with the fifth power uh, of the radius of the star, and that's what we show here with the with the line in this figure. So just a R to the fifth law, okay? That it's followed by the calculations in a reasonable way. And uh, you can see that the, uh, there, is, uh, there is depending on the dipole, uh, sorry, tidal deformability that you are observing from your gravitational wave signal, 
uh, you may constrain some of those models directly on the plot. Okay. Okay, so let's go uh, further. In the sorry, in the left hand side, in the left hand side figure, I just showing you again this mass radius relation, okay, with some constraint from the gravitational wave signal. You can see a let's say a purple arrow, uh, which is called uh, GWB 170817, which is this uh, this um, neutron star merger uh, that was uh, detected in in 2017. Okay, so now I would like to to, to just connect uh, the the physics maybe on the uh, on the uh, on the neutron star and on the and the physics of uh, nuclei. And um, the connection is not that uh, crystal clear, or it is clear, but uh, one needs there are some caveats, let's say. So one needs to be careful. And the point is the following: so. It has been uh, shown, okay, that the what we call in nuclei the neutron skin thickness, so the difference between the neutron and proton root mean square radii, uh, is related to the equation of state, okay? How it is related to the equation of state? Because it, when you, for example, um, um, imagine you have a nucleus which is neutron rich, and in the outermost part uh, you get many neutrons, okay? Somehow those neutrons, what we what they will feel is uh, the neutron pressure, okay, uh, at a density which is slightly smaller than saturation, okay. So that what they will feel uh, is this pressure actually, it's uh, related uh, to the uh, the slope of the symmetry energy at saturation, okay, as you can see in the equation, which is uh, with, within a box within a red box, okay. So you see that that's the pressure for any delta, any. Uh, uh, any neutron to proton and density differences. But uh, as long as you are studying neutrons, you put delta equal one, and this means that the pressure, neutron pressure in that case, it's proportional to the slope of the symmetry energy. Okay, so if these neutrons, which are in the outermost part of the nucleus, are feeling actually this slope of the symmetry energy, depending on how large is this slope, the larger will be the, uh, so the larger this slope, the larger will be uh, the, uh, the, the pressure within uh, with which, sorry, each neutron will push out the other neutron, which has, which is close to him in this neutron-rich nucleus, and therefore the larger will be what we have called the neutron skin thickness. You, you can do, see this by actual calculations by using then energy density functionals. Here, for the case in the left-hand side figure, uh, for the case of lead 208, uh, you can see the neutron skin in the uh, vertical axis, while you can see the uh, L, uh, the L parameter in the horizontal axis. You can see the larger the value of L, the larger the value of the neutron skin, which is measuring Fermi's in that figure, and L is measuring MEB. And um, one can think, okay, can, one can say, okay, so that must be the same for the star, right? So if the neutron pressure is larger, so the radius of the star will be larger, and I would say that's correct, and therefore you are connecting uh, the, 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 the world, let's say, of the very small, like the nucleus, with the world of the very big, like the neutron star, by using the same type of very simple physics, okay? But uh, uh, that's not the whole story, because, as I was telling you before, the neutron skin uh, will be, let's say, uh, somehow sensitive to the neutron pressure, but the neutron pressure at which density, so the density will be a density uh, which will be around saturation or smaller, Okay, because we are in a nucleus. Uh, while in the star, uh, this is not the case. In a star can span densities which are two, three, four times saturation density in the core, in the inner core, two densities which are zero, let's say, and in the in the in the outermost part. Okay. So this means that uh, you will be uh, this the, 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 the whole structure of the of the star. Uh, will be sensitive to different densities as saturation density, and that's why nuclear physics is important, but will be also sensitive to other higher densities, okay, uh, in which nuclear physics is not giving information. So the physics of nuclei is not giving information to this very high density in the star. So this we need to learn from the observation. Uh, if you want to look at the star as a whole, then you may think uh, that uh, maybe you are probing a kind of average density of the star uh, uh, while looking at the radius, but that will be too simplistic somehow, okay? So one needs to take care. So the physics may be the same, uh, the connection is not that easy, okay? 
Okay, another maybe uh, at the moment maybe not uh, not very promising. I promise you some promising observables. Maybe this is not promising, but maybe it will be promising at some point. I don't know. And I will tell you. I will explain you about that observable now. So that's an observable which is uh, that one can measure in the air. Actually, one can measure it by elect elastic electron scattering, uh, which is very nice because it's uh, let's say uh, it it does not involve a strong interacting probes, which is good. Okay. The problem is that uh, the problem is I will tell you now. Okay. So uh, this observable is the uh, charge the charge uh, radius difference. Uh, in mirror nuclei, okay? If I take, for example, I keep, I keep put here an example between mirror nuclei, nickel 54 and iron 54, okay? Uh, if I take uh, the difference in this, in the charge radii of this uh, uh, two mirror nuclei, what I will find out is that it must be equal to the neutron skin thickness of iron 44, 54, sorry, if and only if I just spin symmetry breaking is let's say fulfilled. Since we know in nuclei as a spin symmetry breaking, uh, it is, let's say, not an exact symmetry, but it is, uh, depending on the observable you study, it's uh, uh, rather well, let's say, fulfilled, uh, let's say, symmetry. One may think, okay, the neutral skin is very difficult to measure because I must measure neutrons. I will come back to this point later. Uh, but just believe me that neutrons are uh, difficult to measure. Uh, and okay, so then uh, why not to measure proton, which is easier with electromagnetic probes, okay? Um, and that's okay. And we can do that uh, from, let's say, experimentally uh, very nicely. On the one side, for example, iron 54, which is stable, we can do it very nicely. No problem, let's say. But we have problem with the proton-rich partner, with the proton-rich partner, which is this nickel-54, which is not, uh, I think it's not stable, yeah? Uh, it's very proton-rich. And what happens when it is very proton-rich? Means that the uh, last uh, uh, proton, uh, the, the last the, the occupied proton levels are very close to the continuum, okay? And many in many cases, uh, well, in many cases, in all cases, I would say, uh, those nuclei uh, have also or, or uh, still also pairing correlations, kind of say strongly, and they couple to the continuum. And so, from the theoretical point of view, it's uh, it introduces many uncertainties. Okay, it's not clean, and this is what I'm trying to show you in the right hand side two figures. Uh, so, in the upper side, I'm showing you this uh, uh, difference in the mirror in the in the in the char radii of mirror of these two mirror nuclei. Okay as predicted by theory and as a function of the L parameter. Okay, in the upper panel, you see that uh, uh, the red line with the dots are just the model predictions. You see, to, it looks like there is a very nice linear correlation, but then when you plot the uncertainties associated to these theoretical calculations, you see which are corresponds to this ellipsoid, you see that actually uh, the accuracy uh, of these calculations is very low. And the reason is that because the theoretical treatment of this, let's say, uh, unstable or very exotic uh, proton-rich nuclei is very difficult from the theoretical point of view. We have many uncertainties, uncertainties associated to the continuum, to the pairing correlations, et cetera, et cetera. Also to the formation, for example, okay? Uh, then if you look, you look the same calculations for left to eight as a function of L, like the previous figure I've shown you before, and you see again a very nice linear correlation. This blue line in the lower, uh, in the lower, in the lower figure in those two panels in the right, and and you can see that actually this, uh, the, if you plot the errors, you see that the errors are very narrow. So the errors are, uh, let's say, plotted within this kind of ellipsoid, which would correspond to the correlation ellipsoid uh, that gives information not only on the error but also on how good these two quantities are correlated according to a given model. Okay. So this means, yeah, this means that, uh, okay, yeah, in both observables, you get a very nice correlation, but as long as you try to calculate the errors and the correlation, let's say properly by proper statistical methods, then you realize that while uh, for the scheme, you have better things under control in your models, this is not the case for the different the charity. So maybe in the future when theory uh, becomes better, 
uh, uh, then it would be uh, very useful to to use the difference in the charge radii mirror nuclei to learn more about the equation of state. At the moment, it's as I was telling you, kind of difficult. Okay, so um, before I told you that uh, neutrons were difficult to measure. Okay, so it's not that they are difficult. So you can we can prove neutrons in many ways. Okay, the problem is that in many cases you we need to use and uh, let's say reactions which are difficult to model and that depend on maybe uh, and that depends for example on optical potentials that we need to in some cases determine uh, phenomenologically okay uh, so there are there are some systematic errors in in uh, in uh, in all of the experiments we do or most of the experiments we do by using scrolling drafting pros just because we don't know the optical potential we don't know which is the interaction that will that will not happen for example if the interaction was like the uh, for example for electromagnetic interaction that we know very well we know how to model and therefore we will not have this uh, systematic error which are attached to the model dependence of our analysis of a given observable right so uh, for example uh, and this happened for neutrons neutrons does not interact electromagnetically so we just uh, can only prove them in principle or we are one of the most traditional ways to prove them is by using a strong interacting probes because neutrons like to uh, interact strongly, okay? But they don't, don't like much to interact, let's say, electromagnetically. Actually, they don't interact almost electromagnetically. Uh, unless you try to, uh, let's say, build up some kind of experiment, specially devised for that, okay? For example, uh, what I'm presenting in this slide is the parity violating electron scattering, okay? And this parity relating to scattering is actually able to measure or to probe neutrons in a nucleus, which is very important because neutrons, remember, is what will help us understanding uh, uh, the neutron matter equation of state or the symmetry energy, which is something that uh, we are not, uh, let's say, describing, let's say, uh, at least uh, very well uh, when we are, uh, let's say, uh, doesn't matter looking at microscopic or phenomenologic models, those does not agree. Uh, up to the accuracy, we would like, of course. To some point, of course, they agree, but we would like them to be more precise because otherwise our predictions, as I was showing you before, in the mass radius relation of a star uh, will be much more narrow and, and, and therefore we will be able to learn much more uh, in the future by future observations or measurements. So this parity violating electron scattering uh, works as follows. So you just need to, uh, let's say, use electrons as a probe, uh, but you, the only thing you need to do is polarize them along the beam line or opposite to the beam line. And depending the, on this polarization, uh, the electrons will feel uh, uh, the Coulomb plus the weak potential or the Coulomb minus the weak potential. Then you can build up uh, a kind of interference observable that we will call the parity violating asymmetry, which is defined here in the slide in the formula in the right hand side, uh, which just uh, give you this difference between the differential cross sections uh, with the plus means that the electrons are polarized along the beam line with the minus means that the electrons are polarized against, let's say parallel, but against the, the, the beam line. Um, uh, the problem in this experiment is that, let's say, for example, you have the kinematics of the so-called PREX experiment, which was done uh, for LED 208. Okay, at this kinematic, which were electrons at uh, one GeV, uh, you can imagine only one electron, uh, every one million of electrons would interact via the weak interaction, which is the one that couples to neutrons, okay? So the, the, the weak interaction will essentially couple to neutrons while the electromagnetic interaction will essentially couple to protons, okay? Therefore, with electromagnetic, you probe protons. With the weak interaction, you probe neutrons. Uh, those experiments are very demanding, and actually, the, the statistical errors were very large in the first, first run of this experiment. Then those were improved in the second run. The important thing is also uh, uh, to prove, actually, that uh, this type of observable is actually related to the equation of state. And that can be actually shown by a very simple model. So if you assume the, the plane wave Born approximation and try to calculate the parity violating asymmetry, you immediately see that uh, it must, uh, in this crude approximation, it must relate linearly with the neutral scheme, okay? And this is the formula you can see in the lower part of this slide. 
uh, then you when you can go to the actual calculations of this uh, quantity okay that you don't assume plane waveform approximation so you do the, the full distorted waveform approximation uh, with the coulomb and the weak uh, the weak interacting potential and then you can find uh, all these all these results there uh, where uh, there is a clear and strong correlation between disparity relating asymmetry at the in that case the p rate kinematics and the neutron skin of the same nucleus meaning that this uh, this uh, observable is directly informing you about a neutron or let's say a neutron to proton let's say relative inf uh, information on the nucleus in this case the neutron skin okay and therefore since the neutron skin is related to the pressure neutron pressure around saturation therefore it's giving you information on the equation of another observable sir another observable that it is very uh, very nicely uh, related to uh, uh, the question of state is the dipole polarizability. Okay, uh, dipole polarizability uh, uh, it can be let's say studied by um, uh, in many ways. For example, you can also use a strong interacting proof. But this type of experiment, for example, using polarized protons, are kind of uh, let's say quite well understood. Let's say both the reaction and the connection between the cross section and the and dipole polarizability uh, and actually uh, actually uh, theoretical models very simple theoretical models are telling us already that the polarizability must be somehow related uh, uh, to the question to the new to the skin the relation is not that simple so uh, actually by uh, studying it uh, more in detail one realizes that it is the polarizability times the symmetry energy at saturation density that of the question of state which is related to the neutron skin thickness of the same nucleus and you can see in this figure that's for led to it again and uh, as you can see in this figure that actually this correlation by plotting many many different models is actually fulfilled so by measuring the polarizability in led to eight i can get information on an on the relation in that case between the symmetry energy at saturation and the neutron skin and since the neutron skin is related with a slow parameter L, if you want, you can get a relation between the symmetry energy J and the and the and the slow parameter L. Okay, okay. So uh, now one thing uh, we have done in the in the very recently actually it's in the archive but it has not been published yet. Uh, so let's try to if if we like very much this. Uh, uh, this parity violating asymmetry because it gives a real clear access to the neutron skin and also the dipole polarizability that seems to be also clear and, and well understood uh, so why not to check uh, the experiments we have at hand so uh, at the moment we, uh, the parity violating asymmetry has been measured in calcium 48 and uh, led to eight just for uh, one momentum transfer just for a, for a single angle and a given energy in the scattering, uh, let's say, in the for the electron beam, which means we are, just have one one uh, momentum transfer, so we, we just have one point. Uh, and the dipole polarizability, which has been also recently measured uh, uh, by using the polarized proton scattering, actually uh, in calcium 48 and lead to it, it has been also measured in other nuclei, but the parity rating asymmetry has been only measured in these two. Well, maybe also. Uh, 27 aluminum and 12 carbon, and it has been also measured, but those maybe uh, are uh, a bit light for energy density functions to be accurate enough. And therefore we look at those two nuclei, uh, which actually has another advantage, which are double magic, which means that from theory, we have them very much under control. Okay, those are spherical, there are no pairing correlations. Those are, those are we described with the models, the binding energy and the charge ID very well. So it's more safer for us from theory to gain information from those from those two nuclei than from other nuclei in which uh, maybe uh, more complications from the theoretical side uh, may let's say may make more difficult let's say the interpretation of the experimental results so in this figure uh, so in the left hand side you see casting 48 uh, so in the let's say six panels in the left hand side you see casting 48 and led to it uh, we plot the polarizability slow parameter neutron skin as a function in the horizontal line of the parity violating asymmetry and the gray bands are just the experimentally determined regions 
Okay, and as you can see, uh, while for LED 208, it seems that some of the models are able to uh, uh, describe the uh, parity variating asymmetry uh, within the error band, uh, for the case of calcium 48, we are not able. That can be also extended not only for energy density functional, this would be uh, the same if we extend this type of calculations for, for, um, for, up, initial, for up initial results as long as the correlations we have shown you before uh, holds, still holds, okay? Uh, in order to see this, uh, this situation maybe more clear, uh, what was going on? So the problem is calcium and lead or what, what's the problem, no? So we can try to look at the same thing by another uh, perspective. And now I'm focusing on the two panels which are on the right-hand side, okay? These two panels in the upper part, I'm plotting the parity violating asymmetry of lead 2 as a function of the parity violating asymmetry of lead 2 of calcium 48. And you can see that models are not able to overlap with the experimental allowed uh, uh, region. So they are able to describe lead, not calcium, but they don't overlap to, let's say, to the place where the two experiments overlap. And they are actually far. We have tried to extend our models and to try to overlap this far, but that's not, has, it, are not, it has not been possible yet. Uh, while if you look in the lower uh, right, the, the, the upper, uh, sorry, the lower most uh, figure in the right hand side, uh, where uh, we plot the polarizabilities of calcium 40 and lead 2 you see that the models are able to overlap with the experimentally, let's say, a lower region. Meaning that it looks like from theory of from energy density function, as we are able to understand the polarizability, while we are not able yet to understand precisely uh, the parity variating asymmetry which is the PT because that's a very clean probe of neutrons that I was trying to sell you before. Uh, so we need to work more and try to understand what may be going on there. And uh, just to finish, uh, just to finish with my presentation, let me just discuss briefly uh, the uh, isobaric analog state, okay? So the isobaric analog state <clears throat> is nothing but a charge exchange reaction where you exchange a neutron into a proton. So it depends strongly on the strong interaction. Okay, but it has some nice features and, and you will see now. So in principle, uh, this part, this uh, isobaric analog state uh, will excite a neutron. For example, I'm putting here the example, which is very simple of the zirconium 90 between, a, sorry, we'll change a proton, uh, sorry, a neutron in the, of the, in the one G9 half level, and we'll promote a neutron, uh, let's say, with, uh, a neutron in the, uh, sorry, ufa, a proton in the, uh, in the, let's say, into the same level. Due to the fact that uh, protons are shifted due to the Coulomb interaction, you get some energy in order to produce the, this type of charge exchange excitation. And this uh, energy, as just by the picture I just give to, gave to you, will depend essentially on this shift due to the Coulomb interaction, right? So since the Coulomb interaction uh, approximately I, is shifting all the levels, all the proton levels as a wall upwards so to, let's say, less bound states, and this means that you can also try to study in a kind of simple model because it will not be level dependent. So uh, actually, uh, it is very nice to study this isobaric kind of state with a simple model, just with a lot with the Coulomb energy predicted by the droplet model, and you will see that you will be close to the experimental value. Okay, you will be close, but you will not be, let's say, describing the experiment, and that's because in principle you have, and that's uh, maybe at the level of hundreds of kV, has some contribution. Okay that comes from isospin symmetry breaking, okay, in the medium, okay? Uh, we know how isospin symmetry breaking in the vacuum is, okay, because we can do scattering and, and have the scattering length of the new nuclear, 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 nuclear scattering data. But the problem is that we, don't, we are not sure about isospin symmetry breaking in the medium, okay? That's a very tiny effect that it usually has no, no relevance, okay? You want to study, for example, the mass of lead to weight. But uh, in the case of you want to study the isobaric analog state in lead to weight, then it, it becomes important, okay? So, and I will tell you, show you in a figure, uh, sorry that I couldn't go more into detail in this slide, but I think it's not needed to get the point. So I will leave you the slide so that you can go into the detail of these equations, which is not very complicated. And, and that's the figure, let's say, to explain the point. So if I take my models and try to, the, to uh, write down within my models the energy of the isobaric analog state 
as a function of the neutron spin, and this led to it again, okay? And, and, I, and I try to uh, see if those models try to uh, describe well the experiment, which is this dashed la horizontal line, okay? Uh, I will see that uh, no model is able to explain the experimental, the experimental data, okay? And, and that's a pity. So you may tell, you, you may ask me, why you don't plot the experimental error in the Zubaric analog state, energy led to it? And I will tell you, it's so small that uh, you will not see it, okay? So because we know how to measure very well the isobaric analog state in many nuclei, okay? It's not, it's, it, these observables, uh, in my opinion, could be very much promising uh, also due to this, to this very important point, okay? And what's going on? Why these models are not able to describe the experiment? So the main point is because there is no isospin symmetry breaking associated to the nuclear strong interaction. So those models only contain the uh, Coulomb interaction that breaks isospin symmetry and then therefore can give, can give some contribution to this isobaric analog state. So the isobaric analog state will be zero if there were no isospin symmetry breaking in nuclei, okay? The most important term is Coulomb, but then you have also other terms coming from the strong interaction. But we don't know the strong interaction in the medium. So what can we do, okay? So what can we do is try to, <laughs> to feed this data in order to learn about the isospin symmetry breaking in the medium. But we don't know, uh, but we don't know either, for example, if you look at this plot, we have the isospin, sorry, you have the, uh, the energy of the isobaric analog state, the neutral scheme, okay. And then some contribution that we don't know yet, and that it, it may be, let's say, represented by this red arrow, you can see more or less in the middle of the figure. Uh, but this contribution, we don't know, and will be different depending on the model you are studying. So you have a degeneracy. So, uh, or you tell me which is the neutron scheme in that 208, and then I will tell you how big isospin symmetry mating in the video will is. Or you tell me which is the isospin symmetry breaking in the medium, and then I will tell you the neutron scheme in that. Okay, so there is this kind of this type of degeneracy. And uh, with this slide, I would like to I would like to finish. Okay, because then uh, it came another uh, it came a uh, it came another block somehow in my presentation. Okay, which are more related to which type of theory we are using and uh, which type of uh, theoretical methods uh, uh, are we using to, in order to describe uh, all these properties. Okay, but this uh, will, uh, will need a lot of time and will be maybe another, another seminar. And so, I, but I, will, I, I didn't want to take out this slide because I think those can be some kind of somehow informative to you and then can give you also some references that you may like to check or to study, or I don't know, but thank you very much. And I would like to thank my collaborators, <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm.